for being back here on time. Um, the question was before around lunch. That was the decision made last week around discretionary spending. I decided that lunch is discretionary. So at least my committee, there will be no Kai. Um, so I decided today other chairs can make that. And, other and was there a reason that you didn't tell us? I emailed you yesterday. Yesterday? Yes. Last night. Last can night. I just say that I congratulate you, well done. But what would be really good when we're in a building that doesn't have a cafeteria, I'm happy to pay, delighted to pay. Parliament used to have a tab and you didn't even pay, you just walked up and grabbed something and they put it on your tab and then once a month you got the bill and you paid it. Uh, what I'd really like is somehow be able to place an order where we could get a filled roll. I mean, only three things, a filled roll, a pie and a sandwich. And I'll pay, happily pay, I'll pay for others, but at least that we could have it here. The problem with this building, because it's just so awful, you cross the right, I cross the road to a food court thinking, wow, and it's just nothing but Chinese food. There is nothing like a roll or a pie or a sandwich you can get. So if we could have the ability to get the food in, but I'm for, Chinese food. But I don't want, I don't want it for free. Got a I do, I'm, I'm a big fan. Congratulations <laughs> on your austerity drive. Cool. Kia ora, thank you. And uh, yeah, good point. We'll look into that, Councillor Williamson. Um, I guess my only advice until that might happen is that people just drop into level three on the way from the office to here and grab a, grab a sandwich or a sandwich. In addition, Mr oh, Chair, can we ensure that we have real cups oh, and not the throwaway stuff? I'm very supportive of that. Happy to wash it myself. Thank you, Councillor. Um, we are not going to go to item nine. We are going to, as we have mana, mana whenua representatives here um, who've been waiting, we're going to move um, item 14, our Kaha Wairahi Ki Whakatiwai, um, Beachlands and East Pilot Report on the Shoreline Adaptation Plan. We'll bring um, our officers and members of our mana whenua forward. That's all right. Do I need to move the precedence of business? Okay. Cool. That's supported anyway by Councillor Baker. And Councillor Ferry and everyone else. Good. So I think we have Lara, Natasha, Paul, Zaylene, and Gavin. If you want to introduce yourselves um, one by one. Good. Thank you for being here. And just um, tap on your microphones. Thank you. Gavin Anderson uh, representing Nati for Nanga today. Kia ora tato. Tēnā tato te whare, ko Zaili Maxwell Butler tēnei e mihi kau atu ki a koutou katoa no ngai tai uh, ki tāmaki anu hoki a hau. Uh, no te wahi nei uh, kahawai rahi ki whakatiwai uh, tēnei te take on ki te tēpui tēnei wā. No reira. E mihi atu ki a koe o te rā ki a koutou. Kia ora. Kia ora, ko Paul Klonek, Taku Ingwa, General Manager of Resilient Landing Coast Department. Kia ora, Pauta, ko Dr Natasha Elizabeth Carpenter, Taku Ingwa. I'm the Coastal Management Practice Lead in Resilient Land and Coasts. Kia ora, ko Lara Clark, Taku Ingwa. I am the Principal Coastal Adaptation Specialist in Resilient Land and Coasts. Um, pleased to be here today. Kia ora everyone, thank you for your time today. Um, I've prepared a brief presentation on the Kahuai Rahi Ki Whakatiwai Beachlands and East Shoreline Adaptation Plan, but through the chair, if I may, um, direct to, to Zaylene and Gavin to, to say a few words beforehand. Aye, please do. I suppose firstly to say that it's been an absolute privilege to work with this team. Uh, they've included uh, Ngāiwi Mana Whenua Tamaki Makoto right from the outset of the project. Uh, coming into the uh, infrastructure and environmental services, uh, Hui presenting to us through that manner and seeking buy-in. Um, there was the first pilot, Whangaparoa, um, and then carrying on down to this vulnerable coastline here. Uh, and we've worked together at every step of the way. It's been really an awesome experience. Um, they've come to my marae, Umupuya, 
and sat down with my cousin Laurie Beamish, who's one of our kaumatua, and he's also an expert in this matter in terms of tangaroa, the moana, coastal edges, etc., etc. Um, and we've done really, you know, good wānanga together that's resulted in this document. Uh, very proud of the work we've done together um, and stand behind it every step of the way. Kia ora. Kia ora no uh, Just reiterating what Zaylene has spoken about in terms of the engagement, but what I'd like to speak particularly on is the, um, the connection it has to other Auckland Council and the CTO's documents. Uh, in particular, uh, Te Tauriki mm. um, and the relevance that has to this kaupapa today. Uh, we have done um, three to date, um, including Whangapurua, um, also a more in-depth and um, hands-on look at uh, Waimanoa, uh, Little Shoal Bay, and the challenges that uh, the uh, local board there are, uh, are faced with, but also bring it to, to uh, Te Kawairahi, uh, Ki Te and it's... Um, it's work that's been brokered uh, long before we got to the table. Um, many of the faces around um, I, I recognise uh, at this table. And uh, there are iterations of the work that no doubt you have been part of. Um, but it was really important um, for us to be here as the face uh, for our iwi who are involved in this kaupapa and to be able to, uh, to ensure you that uh, we were engaged, um, we had a role to play and... We want to be part of the next iteration. You know, we want to uh, ensure that the, the, the challenges and the, uh, the, uh, the opportunities that are presented us with the current environment, that uh, we are part of the planning, we are part of the future, and uh, we have our own uh, values, we have our own beliefs, we have our own systems that we would like to share and to get the outcomes we're looking for across Tamaki Makaurau. Nō reira, tēnā koutou. Kira and Namahi, Gepin and Zaylin for your, for your input throughout the shoreline adaptation plans. I'll just um, run for a brief presentation just to capture um, some of the, the key messages that, that you'll see within the memo and the report. So shoreline adaptation plans are, are our first tranche of documents for Tamaki Makoro to look at the sustainable management of council-owned land and assets, so all of our esplanade reserves, regional parks and the assets within our coast protection structures, our coastal um, recreation structures that we have over the next 100 years. So they take into effect the impacts of coastal hazards and climate change, including coastal erosion, coastal inundation and catchment flooding, and in particular sea level rise and seasonal rainfall changes. They are developed, as, as I hope you can see, um, with iwi throughout at both a regional and a local scale. And there's also a critical piece of engagement with communities to understand the values of the coast and to work with the infrastructure providers and asset managers um, around those assets that are present around the coast beyond Auckland Council, but also into Auckland Transport and Water Care. And overall, they recommend a series of high-level adaptation strategies over the short, medium and long term. So they're essentially a, a foundation of that dynamic adaptive pathways approach. You'll all be aware of the recent storm events and how those have really raised the awareness across Tamaki Makoro of natural hazards and climate change impacts and really heightened some of the importance of this work program. The shoreline adaptation plans align with best practice in that they adopt the Ministry for the Environment, Coastal Hazards and Climate Change guidance, in particular adopting that dynamic adaptive pathways approach. So, so knowing that we don't know everything about climate change, but what we can do is respond to some of those uncertainties and build that into our process. So essentially the shoreline adaptation plans are intended to be a living document in somewhat the same way that you would have seen with the UK shoreline management plan approach in that we can have further iterations of them and we can build in that flexibility as our understanding changes. They are part of a wider ecosystem of council projects. Um, so, so they were really for, for, for the shoreline adaptation plans. They sit under that umbrella of the legislative framework, um, but they were really driven for us through the, the coastal management framework, which was adopted in 2017, which is quite an operationally focused document, looking at how we need to um, create a more strategic approach to how we manage our council land and assets, and particularly in response to storm events such as we've just had. 
And then that was further strengthened through to Taruki Atafri, where we became a key implementation outcome under the resilient communities and coasts under that adaptation work stream. And just like to acknowledge that there are other work programs and strategies that sit to complement the work within the shoreline adaptation plans, which are a non-statutory document, such as we have through the water strategy. And all these things work together across the council family to guide those so statutory and non-statutory plans and operational tools that I'll talk about a bit more under implementation. For the shoreline adaptation plans in particular, just down the side there, you can see some of the range of different departments um, and the CCOs that we've been working with throughout the development of, of this shoreline adaptation plan and across the programme. So in terms of implementation, as I've said, this is really our first generation of these documents. They are non-statutory and at the moment focused on that scope of council-owned land and assets. Some of the ways that they can be implemented is through direct directing those operational post-storm responses. So where we haven't had these plans available in the past, the community expectation is typically a like-for-like -like replacement or a build back better. But we do know that when we have $900 million of coastal assets around, around our coastline, that we can't continue that approach forever. Um, so we need a more strategic mechanism to understand what our long-term plan is in response to some of those storm responses, uh, ongoing maintenance. In turn, also identifying those preferred options within the coastal renewals program. So, so within Resilient Land and Coast, we, we manage the, the coastal renewals work program, um, but there's a, a, a part in there to understand what the best practice response is. We're also working on coastal asset management planning to inform, inform that longer term capital investment piece. So how, what is funding going to look like for climate change in the longer term? And that also feeds into those future funding requirements and that longer term piece around how we take a more transformational approach to dynamic adaptive pathways. So just now to move on to focus on the Kahawairahi Ki Whakatiwai shoreline adaptation plan. We've engaged with both local iwi and the regional infrastructure and environmental services Kaitiaki Forum throughout. So we've had 11, 11 hui with each iwi grouping. So we've had Ngāti Whanonga, the Ngāti Power Trust Board, and um, Te Akitai Waiohua joining as an observer, and Ngāi Taiki Tāmaki working alongside us um, prior to the launch of the plans through the community engagement piece all the way to today. There's been a, over a four-month community engagement period with a series of in-person, online and digital engagement events and stakeholder workshops with, with all of our asset managers and infrastructure providers at key milestones through the project development. The plan was endorsed by the Franklin Local Board at the end of last term in, in August 2022. And one thing to note is that after, after that endorsement came was when Ngāti Power Trust Board withdrew their support to the plan. So obviously, with recent storm events, we've undertaken a full review of the shoreline adaptation plan, and we're confident that there's no change to the recommendations listed within the report and the high-level adaptation strategies that are recommended. I'm going to take the report as read, but just to sort of emphasise some of the principal work streams involved in the development of the shoreline adaptation plans. They are largely tailored around the Ministry for the Environment best practice guidance for that 10-step decision-making wheel. So we have our iwi engagement, as I've mentioned, that comes up, up front and continues on throughout the, the wheel. The technical work stream, which is where we have our coastal hazards and climate change risk assessment and our understanding of coastal, coastal assets and their condition and how the coast is functioning. Then working with the community to understand the values of the coast and develop some of those objectives to guide some of the high level adaptation strategies whilst we work with the stakeholders on, on fleshing that out over the short, medium and long term. And then upon sort of completion of the plan, that's really the most important part in some respects where we move into the implementation and continuing to monitor and review those plans. So for Beachlands and East, the coast has been broken down into 31 coastal stretches, which is predominantly dictated by the coastal geomorphology of this particular area. And we've been working to understand those four high-level adaptation strategies of no active intervention, so essentially you're, you're do nothing. The limited intervention, which is uh, do a little something to maintain the existing, which could be through dune planting, or it could be around consideration of your access to and along the coast. 
holding the line to defend the coastline against a particular hazard or a suite of hazards, and managed realignment where we recognise that the risk or the expenditure posed by certain coastal hazards or climate change impacts is too high, and there's a need to remove that infrastructure outside of that area um, and naturalise the coast and make more space for a more resilient coastline. As a, as a sort of very brief summary, this, this encapsulates the adaptation strategies across Beachlands and East in the short term, and, and I'll step through with the, the medium and long term. But what you can see here is predominantly blue and blue hashed, uh, which signals no active intervention and limited intervention. And that really echoes through somewhat um, so that we have a lower risk around this coastline during that 20 year time horizon. The purple shows you the areas that are currently protected in some form through hold the line. As we move through into the medium and the longer term, you can see that we start to get some increasing areas of green, which is our mandatory alignment. So that's really recognising those areas where we need to start looking more strategically at how we're going to move some of those assets out of the coast. It doesn't signal a complete abandonment of the area. This is purely focused on the council-owned land and assets but it could potentially be a signal for something that we need to work into longer term across some, the council family. So the Beachlands and East Shoreline Adaptation Plan is, is really our second full pilot. And as Gavin referenced, we've also completed a, a mini shoreline adaptation plan in the past for Little Shoal Bay. So this really closes out our pilot phase of the Shoreline Adaptation Plan program. We're now adopting all of the, the lessons learnt through the programme in, into what is our now regional work programme for the remainder of Auckland's 3,200 kilometres of coast. So you can see here the areas that we've had completed to date. And now we're, we're sort of um, near completion of our next two shoreline adaptation plans for our Fitu Peninsula and Manukau South. And we are in the process of launching our next three shoreline adaptation plans to cover the remainder of the Manukau Harbour. And we're in the active scoping phase of, of the following or the next tranche of three, um, which will cover the open west coast, Tamaki Estuary and Howick. So really here looking at, at covering off and accelerating that work programme now that we have a good process in front of us developed through the pilots. So just to close out and circle back to that implementation piece, is it really is critical. Um, so, so for local implementation, as each plan is completed, including the Beachlands and East plan, it really will direct some of those immediate operational responses post storms and with ongoing maintenance of those coastal structures. It's going to feed into those preferred options for the Coastal Renewals Work Programme, where we have existing budgets already available through the regional fund. And then it's going to support that longer term piece for the coastal asset management planning. So understanding um, what that means for, for the specific assets and translating that more into a dynamic adaptive pathways approach with specific signals and triggers. So this also can be integrated into other plans that are in development, such as the local park management plans and the regional park management plans, so that we're all um, collaborative and speaking from the same song sheet. And in terms of regional implementation, this really needs to come once we have all the shoreline adaptation plans completed across the whole region. We have a regional coastal hazards and climate change risk assessment underway, which is informing some of our regional risk profile. And along with the completion of all of those site-specific shoreline adaptation plans, we're going to have an understanding of what some of our future funding requirements can be, recognising that hold the line and managed realignment are both typically at a reasonably high upfront cost, um, but with differences in terms of the ongoing maintenance. And so those two pieces of information together can work, we want to work with you on developing a more um, objective prioritisation schema for future works, which we know is well needed for how we're going to combat climate change and have a more strategic plan going forward. So thank you very much, and I will pass back to the Chair for questions. Thank you so much, and just, uh, I may speak a little bit at the end, but just thank you so much again for the phenomenal work, both from mana whenua and um, staff and community. It's just, I think we kind of... Uh, hoped or dreamed this would be the process um, as it's gone on and it seems to be building and building and strengthening um, each time. So with, I don't know, 17 more to go or whatever it is, um, it's really good heart for 
uh, and a good example for other things we can do across the council whānau um, on things like this. So thank you. We've got first, uh, first of all, just get um, Councillor Baker would like to move, Councillor Dalton would like to second, and then we'll go to questions. Uh, Councillor Walker. Uh, got a few questions. Um, I was involved with the uh, Whanga Proa, um pilot, and there are a number of issues that I raised there that, again, I'll just raise here. So it, is it the case that this shoreline adaptation plan is, is really okay. just focused on council assets? It doesn't cover um, private assets. That's correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Uh, the reason I mention that is obviously you've got a high expectation on the part of the community that um, it does cover private assets, but clearly it doesn't. Um, the other issue that I raised with the Fong Pro pilot was uh, my observation that the data was out of date. Uh, so the uh, stormwater, the, the catchment managed plans are out of date for Fong Pro for the catchments. The um, climate change data um, on sea level rise and the like is out of date. Um, it tends to be based on IPCC reports that are historical and don't reflect current data around sea level rise and storm surges and, um, and the like. And there are many scientific papers that are occurring in the, in the interim. And I would suggest um, in Auckland, they're significantly out of, um, out of date. And the other question I've, I've got um, that I raised uh, for the Whangapara study is the necessity of the impact on storm events and flooding concurrent with storm surge and sea level rise, king tides and the like, where you've got accelerated and exacerbated um, erosion and quite obviously, as far as storm events are concerned, the pattern that we're seeing currently, where sure, the impact, where the impact on our, uh, I'm being a much much shorter than um, some speakers, Mr. Chair, where the impact of our wider matter series cliffs has probably experienced more erosion um, in the last um, few weeks than they've experience for some time, and if that continues, what does that look like? So I know you said that you've maybe generated an update over the recent storm effects, but I really want to get more certainty around that. So a few questions there, Mr Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, through the Chair, so, so if I maybe start us off with a discussion on some of the coastal hazard mapping that we have. So, so we're using Council's best available information that we have. So for coastal erosion, uh, our latest report was completed in 2020, and that's our areas susceptible to coastal erosion and inundation um, instability. And that covers all of our highest RCP 8.5 plus scenarios under the IPCC AR5. As I understand it, there is a, only a marginal change between that and what is presented in the more recent IPCC AR6. And within the shoreline adaptation plans, we, we do use that higher scenario out to 2130. So it is quite conservative. For coastal inundation, it isn't specifically linked to a specific sea level rise scenario, um, but we go up to the 1% or the present day 1% AEP um, coastal inundation storm surge event. So looking at both the storm surge component and the wave setup component, along with the addition of up to two metres of sea level rise. We do have some additional mapping currently underway, um, which should be making its way through onto the Auckland Council geomaps within the next few months, where we've built in some additional set sea level rise scenarios, taking us up to three metres. Um, at the point that that is available, there will be the ability through the regional risk assessment to build those into the coastal hazards risk assessment across the region, which we suggest would be more prudent to do once we've completed all of the site-specific risk assessments across each of the individual shoreline adaptation plans. And just a further question. Do we forecast the sea level rise that's locked in? So, for example, we know that the formations in the Arctic, and particularly um, Antarctic, the Thwaites Glacier, Ross Ice Shelf and the like, are all going. Uh, Greenland and so on, and there's a specific amount of, of um, 
sea level height that uh, is generated as, as a con consequence of that. And given that that's locked in, and I think that's scientifically um, accepted, do we actually convey that? So the, the sea level rise mapping that we have, and, and within that portfolio we also have some, some current mean high water springs plus sea level rise mapping underway at the same time, and that looks at what our, what our updated current sea level is. Um, so our updated mean high water springs, which is, is you're right, different from, from what it would have been 10 years ago, um, and yeah, a little bit further on when we were looking at the, the last round of coastal marine area mapping that was completed. So it's built in through that process. And then we add on for the future projections on top of that. So, so yes. Um, so just to clarify, so the projections going out around ultimate sea level rise are identified in these coastline adaptation plans, which are, of course, far, far more than two metres. I mean, that's frankly, incidental in the scheme of things. Uh, so I've just got a question around that. Otherwise, my concern, Mr Chair, is, again, it, it lulls people into a huge sense of complacency. It doesn't drive decision-making around mitigation, which is critical. And people often don't realise that, I think, as the Mayor said, cliffside properties are going to go at some point, uh, whether people like it or not, at some point in time, and people in low-lying flood areas, frankly, are going to be far more exacerbated than the present circumstance. We're still in question. So, um, so I, I think the answer I did very, ask a very specific good. question, and it looks like the answer is no. No, that's through, through not the chair. what I heard at all, but um, <clears throat> through the chair, if I may, I, I think Natasha's given, Natasha's given a very specific response to that question around the data that we use. I just want to step it up a level by reminding um, the elected members that the shoreline adaptation plans are living documents. They are living documents that make provision, Councillor Walker, to include new science, new data that's made available. So the information that we're currently using, the data that's reflected within the plans currently is quite conservative, but as new information is made available, we can fold that into the plans. And I would also like to just reinforce the point that we made when we provided an update to committee a couple of weeks ago around some of the recent storm damage. There is quite a lot of um, tailored, specific data capture and work happening at the moment, LIDAR, um, satellite imagery um, being captured and analysed. All of that information is going to be, going to be collected, interpreted um, and made available for use in the plans as well. So we're not, we're not shying away from, from climate change. It, it is real. That's accepted. And we're, we're moving towards helping educate communities around the results of those changes. Um, we're using the best available information and data that we have available at the moment. But, but we, we will, as new data is released, make that available as well. Thank you. And it's my understanding that the what you've given people is quite a, a shock to many, um, but also uh, clarifying what you said post-flood in Cyclone was that the averages over time can sometimes happen with one event. So it might look three centimetres a year for 30 years, and, but it actually happens overnight. So I think that's in here, but that's the difference of what we need to get across to the community is that it's not always a perfect progressive linear thing. Through, through the chair, I, th I think that's a really good point, and I'd, I'd just like to add that what, what we've presented today is our approach with engaging with communities. Um, some of what we present and discuss is a bit of a shock um, to many, and, and the natural response often by members of our community is to challenge what we're saying. Um, sh show us evidence, sh show us the data, show us proof. So again, the ability to call upon um, the guidance as provided by the Ministry for the Environment um, the data is provided by IPCC is, is absolutely critical for these conversations so that it moves it away from a this is what council thinks and this is what staff feel to this is what the industry is directing. Thank you. Uh, member Ashby, then um, Tumora, and then Member Henare. Kia ora. First, um, just to acknowledge you, Zaylene and um, Gavin, for, on behalf of Mana Whenua, um, to the table. and. Um, Thank you for the presentation. And uh, there is a question here, but first, just congratulations on um, getting uh, uh, support of Mana Whenua. You must have done something 
something right because uh, it doesn't doesn't happen too often. Uh, so um, kia ora for that. Uh, my question is um, really just around the implementation, and if you could just explain to me really um, briefly what that looks like for the uh, local iwi involved, um, how that partnership and the good work you've done to date can continue on into the future as you actually roll out this plan over the, the years to come. Kia ora. Absolutely. Um, I can actually give you a, quite a live example for that one. So we're, we're quite committed across resilient land and coasts to continue working with local iwi on the implementation of all of our shoreline adaptation plan implementation. Um, we obviously own and manage the Coastal Renewals Work Programme, which is one of those key pieces of work. Um, so so a, a sort of live example of that would be looking at Sunkiss Bay, which is a current coastal renewal that we have, where we actually have a, a Wananga scheduled with saline at Umapo Marae next week um, to continue working through on the implementation of not just those high-level adaptation strategies, but what does that physically mean when we get through into the implementation? How do we continue to adopt those values through into that physical work programme? Thank you. Um, Councillor Leone. Kia ora, um, na mahi nui kia koutou. Acknowledge our mana whenua as well, Gavin and Saline, um, and the rest of the team. And my, my question was probably a little bit similar. I just wanted to know if there was um, a te ao Māori lens at all that's incorporated in, um, you know, the next steps that you're taking. Kia ora. Oh, I think I should answer this one. Uh, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> Kahawairahi is Pine Harbour. Kahawairahi speaks to plentiful kahawai. That was what it was like back in the time of my ancient tūpuna. The waters were thick and green with kahawai. Te puru. Te puru used to be some, there were scallops, there were mussels, the little black ones, there were pipi, there was all sorts of kaimwana. Gone. All gone. So we have implemented, myself and uh, Laurie Beamish, we have sat with these guys and talked about the stories of old. We've shared through this document a lot of our matauranga, what we know, and um, working closely alongside them, uh, we'll get to hopefully realise, budget pending, um, what we really need to protect our, our shorelines going forward. We're currently under... <clears throat> we're losing a lot of our ancient pahutakawa. Those pahutakawa were markers. They were like GPS coordinates when you're out at sea. When you're looking back into land, that's how you knew where you were. A lot of those are falling. We're lo losing our caves. Our caves have been lost to coastal erosion. Um, whose idea it was to build big houses on top of, uh, you know, big three-storey mansions on top of a sensitive cliff is just mind-boggling. Um, we've also got people living on those cliffs who now want to cover the entire cliff faces with their seawalls. That's an offence to us. They're covering the remnants of our burial caves. They're chopping out pahutakawa because they, they are fearful that the pahutakawa will pull the cliff down. And it may do. How do they think they got front row property? Look out in the shoreline and you'll see where the original whenua once was. So when people get a resource consent to put stairs down a cliff face, isn't that putting harm on that bit of cliff? People going up and down. So it's all of these things that using our matauranga, light touch. It has to be light touch to protect for future generations. And so it's not so offensive to the eye. You just come and have a look at my coastal line and look at, look at all the horrible seawalls that are going up there now. Well, not, um, I think uh, Leone, that, uh, Kira Leone, that might... Um, Answer your pātai. Uh, indeed, we want to always implement our karakia tuatahi, um, our mātauranga tuarua. Kia ora. Hi, nā mihi nui ki a koe wahini tua. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, member Henare. Kia ora. No, no. Uh, um, my brother asked the wrong question. <laughs> <laughs> Kia ora. I was um, just checking. Good, good. So, so quiet today, uh, Member Henare. Um, Councillor Ferry. Kia ora, and I want to acknowledge our mana whenua 
partners at the table and also um, the sharing of, of your mātauranga, which is really significant. Um, my query is really around um, how those conversations are happening with some of our community, and, and you touched on that a bit, um, in terms of, you know, the initial response of sort of, you know, you're going through stages of grief, denial is one of those, right? Um, and getting people to acceptance of, of change. So, um, wondering if there's any lessons that perhaps have been learnt through these pilot processes that we could um, use that might be applicable in some of the other difficult conversations we're having with our communities as well. Uh, and acknowledging Mana Whenua for leading in that space. Thank you. Through, through the Chair, thank you for the question. I, th I think that's a very pertinent question at the moment. I, th I think I touched lightly on some of the lessons we've been learning from engagement with our communities is, I guess, being upfront and honest about what we know and what we need to prepare for. Um, I've talked about the reaction we often get from our local communities who want to challenge some of what we're saying. So again, reference to having good, robust evidence and data. I think, I think importantly as well, what I've learned over the last sort of two decades helping lead conversations with our communities in this space is it's always nice to show and um, take people to a successful case study. So this is what we're proposing and people often find it hard to envisage um, what managed retreat or naturalisation of the coast might look like. You know, I'm, I'm used to seeing a seawall. You're talking about removing the seawall and, and, and helping nature um, or, or working with nature to restore what was there pre-modification. I can't quite see it, I can't quite envisage it. So, so the team's been working really hard and Auckland Council's been doing some absolutely amazing work in certain areas around our coastline uh, to walk the talk in the space. So removal of seawalls, naturalisation, dune enhancement, and taking communities um, with us to those locations and to step them through how successful that's been has worked really well. Um, how might we apply some of those lessons to the current challenges that we face um, as a region, post um, flooding and Cyclone Gabrielle? Um, again, I think we're still in a, a part of the conversation where communities are asking lots of questions around the why and what's next. Um, we're working really hard to collect evidence and data to support um, some, of the, some of the more difficult conversations that we'll need to follow around what the future looks like. Again, I think it's a natural reaction to want to, if it doesn't, um, if it involves you, your property, your family, to challenge or resist. So it's but upon us to be able to respond with, again, good evidence, good data, good rationale, and the team's doing amazing work across the council family in that space at the moment, so. So how can we ensure that uh, you have the resources, by which I mean budget, uh, to um, continue to do that work effectively in terms of gathering evidence and, and communicating that with the community? So through the chair, an another great question. Um, at present, we have the funding and the resources required to deliver what we've committed to. So under the coastal management framework and what Natasha's um, set out from a shoreline adaptation plan um, delivery program. Um, we have that locked in and that's working well. I, I think there may in time need to be a discussion around possibly speeding up the work program to deliver more plans more quickly and if that's the case because of Auckland's appetite at the moment to have a better understanding of where to from here, how do we adapt and how do we become more resilient, there might be a conversation that we need to have around um, additional budget to support that work program but for now um, we have what we need. Kia ora, thank you. I could, last question from me, um, and I guess it's specifically on the whole plan. So we do have three um, pretty phenomenal plans right now. What do we do in the in the meantime? Because we're still going to have these ad hoc, especially if I look at the the carnage around our coast, that people immediate expectation is that wharf, those stairs, those. Um, it, XYZ, those dunes at Long Bay, there's all, all sorts of different things. You know, when are you going to get all that fixed? How will you be able to play into that sort of uh, try and use these examples to extrapolate maybe what could be one off decisions right across the city that we keep making the same mistakes with? Are you able to use some of this to, in the meantime? 
Um, yes, yes. So, so, I mean, we have some, some good examples at the moment that we can continue to build on both through the shoreline adaptation plans and our operational management. Um, so, so we have had previous examples of structures failing as a result of coastal storms and looking at the best practice that we have and the shoreline adaptation plans are really another piece of that. Um, we have the coastal management framework that sits there and sets out those principles alongside the Ministry for the Environment guidance. Um, so, so we can apply those more broadly outside of areas where a specific shoreline adaptation plan exists. Um, examples of that being areas such as Stanmore Bay and some of the past 2018 storms where we had a series of rocks, illegal rocks on the beach and we were able to remove those and naturalise the coast um, and restore what, what's really a, a beautiful area now of dune planting. Um, so building in those, work, those works and how that aligns with the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement and our other tools um, can be done outside of what we have within the sort of remits of the Shoreline Adaptation Plan program. Um, that's all I have for questions. So if I could ask you to move away from the table so we can debate um, each other, not you. Um, but kia ora and thank you very much for all the work. Um, Councillor Baker, would you like to go first or last? Or both? Look, I hope it's both. Um, now, um, I just want to uh, first acknowledge um, Gavin and Zaling, and great to have you guys here. Um, but I want to acknowledge the staff and um, and the process obviously had a bit to do with this in um, in the previous term and with the uh, the Monaco uh, one that's underway and so just acknowledge the the outstanding work and I guess just to something that um, um, Paul talked about is it's the communication with uh, whilst we're talking about council land um, ostensibly it's the knowledge that is passed on to the community during those public sessions that is so valuable to them. And uh, we've seen that um, you know, time and time again where the people just, they, they look at what we're doing and, uh, and how can they apply that to their land as they really sit there and can't really figure out in their own mind what the changing shoreline means to them. So um, I just want to commend this for, uh, for, for the vote. I don't want to carry on too long, but just really, really want to acknowledge the team. Um, fantastic effort. and. You know, these areas don't usually make it onto the maps that appear in this room because they're too big. Um, and uh, and so it's great to see this is a huge area, 31 different sectors. Um, and the Manukau's no smaller, um, potentially bigger, because it goes right down the coast and up and around the peninsula. So um, really huge, huge pieces of work. So thank you very much. Kia ora, Councillor. And yeah, just from me briefly, and um, for those uh, who don't understand where this came from, um, Paul's team and others had been kind of proposing this work for a very long time, but it was never maybe prioritised or funded. Um, and through the climate action initiatives and the 2021 long-term plan, this this body of work was funded and locked in. Quite is quite a big part of those climate initiative that climate initiative funding, but. Um, I was shocked, I think, when Paul said, <laughs> we have the great plans for all the coast, but we have about the budget for one plan out of 20. And I said, what, this year? And he said, over 10 years. Um, so I think to see the speed, but also the careful, meticulous way of extended timeframes and worked with community, worked with mana whenua to ensure that we're getting the process right um, for the three we have so far. And I think what has shown, and I've seen the conversations in Waimanoa already change for the people who said, you know, we, everything must be kept as is all the time. The conversations already changed because unfortunately they've seen some of those, what could happen in 10 or 20 years happen over one weekend and people sort of see and understand, okay, we can protect and enhance this area. This might have to change. This may, um, this, maybe a different, more exciting plan for the for the area. And this is happening in this process too, because we did and we are still, unfortunately, making those ad hoc decisions, spending quite a lot of money on, um, I can think of assets on the North Shore that, that were fixed up after the 2018 storms and now they've gone again. So we just, unfortunately, there isn't spare money to continue to do that. And as Aileen said, we shouldn't be bashing the whenua um, every time because the storms do it. And then we try and add hard uh, structures in place uh, for our own enjoyment, but then they get um, 
the nature knocks them out again and further uh, ruins that place and that um, land or trees or coast. So it's uh, very, very important work, and this is a phenomenal piece of work, and I know many of you have been working on this a long time, um, but I think it's come at the right time and um, will be everlasting, so thanks a lot. I do have one last comment from Councillor Walker. Sure. Um, so, um, through you, Mr Chair, my recommendation is increasingly that we be more upfront with Aucklanders, and that includes um, forecasting out um, long-term scenarios, uh, which are just a function of time, especially when they're accelerating, and sea level rise and climate change, storm surges, all those correlated things are a moving feast, and it's moving very really rapidly. The other concern that I've got that I think that should be reflected in the uh, shoreline adaptation plans follows the the concept of you know dynamic adaptive pathways. That's the approach that we're taking here, and that is to recognise increasingly that we need structures that are flexible, that certainly in terms of coastline protection are adaptable and almost Lego-like, and that increasingly is the uh, move that's occurring overseas. So it's expected that you put something in place. It may suffer some damage, but you can reconstitute it. And especially in many countries, arguably overseas far more than here, you can actually buy these um, uh, products and they can be put in place quickly and speedily. They're much better than just dumping a pile of rocks and, um, and so on. So I'd like to see a lot more than that. Uh, the other thing that we are still doing is building permanent structures on our own reserves and the like on the coastline when they should and could be portable, particularly surf life-saving clubs who are currently investing significant sums of money in structures in the millions that will succumb to coastal erosion when they could be portable and, and shifted in again. I would refer you to many locations overseas and I could generate a list where this is what is happening, especially in the Netherlands and other places that are ahead of us. So as much and all as this is a useful plan, what I see on the ground is we are not adequately factoring the risk and responding to it, Mr Chair. So that, that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Kia ora, thank you. Right, all those in favour? Aye. Any opposed? Awesome, thank you. That is moved, and now we are.